Morning, everybody. My name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are, in fact, starting a new series called The Adventure of Happiness today, and we're going to talk about all kinds of good stuff, not only today, but between now and Thanksgiving. And, and before we get too far into it, what I want you to do, pretty please, is take out your cell phone, and we're going to participate in a little poll uh, using the cell phone technology that we have, have used in the past called Poll Anywhere, and you're going to send a text message with just one word, the word West Winds, to the number 22. Three, three, three. And what, what we're going to do is participate in a survey that measures how happy West Winds is versus the rest of North America. So we just want to have some good, honest data, because if you're all spectacularly happy all the time, you can probably just tune out, you know, for the next three months. But, but if maybe there's something you need to learn, that'd be great. So you're going to text West Winds to 22333, and then you're going to send a follow-up text that will give a number one through 11, one being the lowest, 11 being the highest. And this is a measurement of how happy you are. So go ahead and throw that uh, spectrum up there for me, uh, Ernie, so everybody can see. If you, if you write down a one, that means you're extremely unhappy, utterly depressed, and completely miserable all of the time. A two, you're very unhappy, you're depressed, your spirits are very low, all the way ranked up. Oh, look, look at all the happy people responding now, right? Uh, all the way up to 11, which is you're extremely happy, euphoric, feeling thankful, overjoyed, etc. So again, the low numbers are crappy, the high numbers are happy, and, and that's how we want you to respond, and you can see it's happening in real time, and we'll go back and look at that again in just a few moments. Now, today, I'm going to have four different people who are going to help me with my talk, because happiness is a huge topic, and I've spent the last six months ardently and the last 15 years casually studying happiness from a philosophical, theological, and psychological perspective, so I got all this all this research, and to help me make sense of it for you this morning, I've got four people who will sit up on the stage, and each of whom will respond to what I'm saying in real time via a chat messenger that will appear on each of the four televisions. So first we have Yvonne Rogers, who's a nonprofit guru. Where's Yvonne? Where, Yvonne? Oh, there she is. All right, give Yvonne a big round of applause. She's one of our West Winds elders right now, so you'll be able to see Yvonne's thoughts over there. On the far side of the room, we're going to have Becky Vite. Where's Beck? Yep, yeah, yeah, big, big claps. There you are. All right. Listen, for the record, if you make a bigger wave, they'll clap more ostentatiously for you. So, Beck, a former West Winds staff member, current West Winds elder, and kind of a leadership guru here around town. Uh, my friend Greg Gallagher will also be over here. Greg is a therapist and the owner of Recovery Technology. And last but not least, Ken Brewer will be on the last computer over here. He is the Department Chair of Theology and Christian Ministry at Spring Arbor University. One big hand for all four of them, please. Thanks. All right. Now, across disciplines, what, what sort of the unilateral consensus is, is that everybody has a way that they can be happier. You might experience some happiness now, but there's a way for you to optimize how much happiness you experience. And there's a fellow by the name of Dr. Martin Seligman, who's, who's the founder, sort of the founding father of positive psychology. And he developed a formula for figuring out how happy you can become. And that formula has been adopted widely across all, all sorts of disciplines. And I'll give it to you now. Jot it in your uh, menu so that people who come next week know what we talked about this week and can, you know, read your handwriting, etc. So the formula works like this. H equals S plus C plus V. Of course, I'll explain that in just a moment, but H equals S plus C plus V. H is, of course, what? Happiness. You guys are so smart, right? S stands for your set range, and what that means is like your, your predisposition. So if you're a naturally cheery person, probably you're going to end up with a bigger bandwidth for happiness. If you tend to be unemotional, dour, kind of a grumpy bum, th then you're going to have a more narrow bandwidth for happiness. There's a way you can alter your predisposition a little, but by and large, we're, we're all basically like that. You've got some people who are chipper and some people who are non-effective, and, and that, that's your set range. The C stands for the circumstances of your life. Those circumstances are things like how much money you make, whether or not you've got a job, uh, if you've got a significant other, what country you live in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, here's the biggest mistake people make about happiness. People mistakenly believe that it's your circumstances that most greatly affect whether or not you're... That's total crap. Absolute garbage. Your circumstances do not affect your level of happiness very much 
over time. So for example, if you buy a new house and it's the house you've always wanted, three months from now, you're not actually going to be any happier even though you're in your dream house. If you think, oh man, I can't wait until I get married, great. Three months after you're married, you're going to be back to where you were before you got married. If you get a huge raise at work, even if you make double the money, three months later, it's going to go back to how happy you were before that. You're going to adjust to your circumstances. Now, If you live in a Western-style democracy and you make and can manage your money enough that you don't run out of money before your next pay period, and if you're with somebody, you know, you got a romantic partner, spouse, boyfriend, whatever, right? If you're with somebody that you don't hate, (laughs) you don't have to think they're awesome. You just have to not hate them. If, If those three things are true, you have reached the apex of circumstantial happiness. So H equals S, which is your set range, C, which are the circumstances of your life, and V. Now, V is the most important one. This is the substance of the book that we've prepared, The Adventure of Happiness. It'll be available for pre-order next week on Amazon. This is the substance of the next three months of teachings at Westwinds, and the V stands for voluntary actions. Here's the most important thing you can know. Happiness is about what you do. The voluntary actions you take, and we broke them down into two big categories, the the stuff that concerns who you are and the stuff that concerns where you live. Now, there's a couple caveats. First of all, it's not just who you are, but it's the promise of who you are going to become. It's the promise of development. And once you get what we call a growth mindset or a developmental mindset, once you get hold of the idea that you can actually, with God's help, become the best possible version of yourself, that, that's the first key, the first massive key to being happy. And, and we break that down into four categories. We break that down into your thoughts, uh, your speech, your heart, meaning the way you give, show, and receive love. And also your legs, meaning what you do. Now, that's, exercise is a part of that, but, but it's much more comprehensive, as we'll talk about as we get closer to that week. So, so that's who you are and who you are becoming. Now, the, the other voluntary action, the other massive component of happiness concerns where you live. But not just, you know, your town or whatever. No, no, no. It's the habits and disciplines you cultivate as part of your lifestyle. And again, we break that down into four components. First of all, is what you do with your screens. Your laptops, your computer, your phone, your video game systems, whatever. What you do with your forge, meaning, meaning your work. We had to pick a metaphor for work. And, of course, there's white-collar work and blue-collar So we picked a forge because nobody uses one anymore. We thought it would be good. <laughs> then also, what you do with your bed, meaning both rest and sex. And last but not least, what you do with your food. How you think about food, whether or not you're terrified of it, whether or not you're eating disgusting food, etc., etc., etc. Now, if you think that I'm going to get on a big dietary bandwagon you're smoking something that I don't want any part of because I'd rather eat a donut than a gluten-free anything. But that's what we're going to talk about when we get close to there. Now, to give you an example, okay, I want you to understand that one of the keys to this that we'll explore again and again and again is, is, is learning how to focus on the positive. In the Bible, we call this renewing the mind. I'll get into some scripture in a second. But you, you've heard this, right, that there's, there's glass half-full people and glass half-empty people. Right now there's thirsty pasture people. <laughs> right? And we all know the old adage that there's optimists and pessimists. There's people who look at this and go, oh, man, that sucks. I feel totally ripped off. I only have a half a glass of water. And there's other people who will look at it and go, oh, that's so fantastic. Look at all the water I have. Now, okay, here's the thing. Optimists are happier. And you can train yourself to be an optimist. You can train yourself with God's help to find and focus on true information. For example, it is true that this glass is only half full, but that doesn't matter. Why? Because I have a giant jar of water right beside it. If I drain this glass, I can easily refill it. But it doesn't even matter that I have a big jug of water here because if that empties out, I could go into the kitchen and refill that. And that doesn't even matter because I don't really drink water anyway. I'm just going to drink coffee all day long. And there's three coffee makers within a one-minute walk of where I'm standing. 
So if you want to be happier, you actually have to broaden the spectrum of true information to which you will attend. Now, here, let me see if I can stretch this point a little further. This right here is a piece of paper covered in periods. There are 2,164 periods on this piece of paper. 40 of them are red. Why red? Those 40 periods represent the most information your conscious mind can handle at any moment. At any moment, in one second, there's all this information flowing through you, and you can only pay attention to 40 things. The problem is that the vast majority of your thoughts are, are negative, somewhere between 80 and, and 70 and 80 percent. Now, uh, Sean Aker, who wrote a book called uh, Beyond Happiness and an earlier book called um, The Happiness Advantage, talks about the fact that we've got to learn and we can learn how to find and focus on these little red dots. But it's hard because there's only 40 on a piece of paper that has 2,164 dots. What's even worse is that this is not the sum total of your thinking every one second. In fact, every one second, you're thinking about that. This is the amount of information your subconscious mind is processing every one second of the day. 11 million pieces of information ranging from how you feel, how your tummy feels, what you ate, whether or not your mouth is dry, whether or not the sermon is boring, and you can only pay attention to 40 things. So one of the keys for becoming a happier person is training your mind to look for the good stuff. Now, even though the vast majority is negative, that doesn't mean that there's not enough. I mean, you still got a couple million pieces of positive information that if you can find them, like the jar of water, like the faucet, like the coffee makers, once you can find them, you will be happier. In the Bible, this is called renewing your mind. And one of the things that's so fascinating about this topic for me is that it feels like social science and positive psychology have finally caught up to what the Bible has been saying for thousands of years. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you'll learn how to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's not the only piece of the Bible that talks about renewing your mind. Let's give you a couple more real quick. Uh, Philippians 4, 8. Whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever. think on these things. Uh, Ephesians 4, 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 1 Peter 1, 13, prepare your minds for action. Colossians 3, 10, be renewed in the knowledge of your mind. Now, of course, this is easier said than done. And you can't learn absolutely everything there is about retraining your thoughts in, you know, five minutes on a Sunday morning. But, but let's at least acknowledge that that's a massive component of happiness. And, and I'll tell you why. I used to be the happiest person in the world. In the season shortly before and after college, I would travel around and I would speak. I'd give seminars. I'd give my testimony, quote, unquote. I'd do presentations on sports-specific fitness instruction and faith. And I used to always say to people, my very first sentence was, I'm the happiest person you're ever going to meet. I'm the happiest person you could ever imagine. And if you... And be happy like and then one day, I got up and I said it, and it immediately rang false. Like I was lying. Not about the false part, I still believe that, but about how happy I was. Now, something happened, and maybe a few somethings happened. Like, for example, I wasn't 20 years old anymore. I wasn't 6% body fat anymore. I now had a real job instead of just, you know, playing rugby and going to college and floating my way through school. So, yeah, once you get old, fat, broke, and uh, yeah, some stuff is going to be happier or harder about being happy. And, and that began my quest to figure out how can I reclaim the enthusiasm, the energy, the euphoria that I experienced as, as a college student in an adult life with real responsibilities. And I've learned over and over and over again that there are some practices and habits that you've got to call if you, if you actually want to be happier. Um, let's, uh, let's do this. Today we're going to talk about five myths of happiness. 
Uh, jot these down in your menus, again, for posterity's sake, so somebody else can get action with them later on. Take pictures of what you write down for your own information, because you're not going to remember what I say. Believe me, this is my first rodeo. I know how this goes. Uh, feel free to post those on Facebook, hashtag Westwinds, and all that good stuff, because, because what we want to do is take this information and, and share it with people. It would be good if more people were happier, and this feels like an easy way to get do this. So from the book The Happiness Trap, here are four myths concerning happiness with, with one more from yours truly. Number one, um, there's a myth that states that happiness is the natural state of human beings. That's not true. Uh, most people aren't happy. S statistically, roughly 40% of Americans claim to be pretty happy most of the time. Ernie, you want to throw the survey results up this morning? So most Americans are going to come in at about a 6 or a 7. Now, you see how West Winds is skewed on the right-hand side towards the happier thing? That, that could just be that you're all fibbing. Um, but it, it also could be the, tr the, the fact that, that statistically ardent, faithful, passionate Christian people report as almost 20% happier than any other control group. But that's still not everybody. And even for the people who are identifying at, you know, 8, 9, 10, there's still more happiness that's possible for us on the table. So the first myth is that everybody's happy if they're normal. The second myth is if you're not happy, you're defective. I mean, these things seem to go together, right? If you sit there and think, I'm supposed to be happy, but I'm not, then of course you're going to conclude that it's because you're a screw-up. Rest assured, you're not a screw-up. Happiness is like a muscle. It has to be trained. You cannot expect happiness. You cannot demand happiness. You, you've got to get strong for happiness. Think about it like uh, bodybuilders. We don't actually have any bodybuilders in the room right now, do we? And of course not, because if I said that, you would have stood up and took off your shirt immediately. I've met you guys before. <laughs> but, um, but, but very few people are bodybuilders. Wait, ha! This is my friend Adam. He's a bodybuilder. This is so great. Don't take your shirt off. That'd be weird, seriously. Um, <laughs> But very few people are bodybuilders, and yet we all understand that in order to get a physique like Adam's, which you're all imagining now under his sweater, but it's okay, he's getting married in like a week, just chill out, okay. Very few people have, and the reason they get it is because they devote every part of their diet and exercise regimen to, to getting like that. Well, happiness is the same way. You can't just expect it. You can't just demand it. You've you got to work for it. Happiness is a, a muscle that has to be exercised. Number three. There's a myth that says in order to create a better life or be happy, we've got to get rid of negative feelings. No, not true. You can't, first of all. It's impossible to get rid of all your negative thoughts and feelings. Look at them. 11 million. You can't just, what, wish them away? Pray them away? No, that's not going to happen. No, good and bad in this life will always exist side by side. Good and bad thoughts, good and bad feelings, good and bad people, good and bad Michigan football teams, everything will be smushed side by side, maize and blue, dirty, filthy, communist Spartans, right? It's all <laughs> just like that. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been hit with a tomato in at least three weeks, so it's good. <laughs> It'll be a green tomato when it happens. <laughs> so good. <laughs> uh, number four. There's a myth that says you should be able to control your thoughts and feelings. There, there again, that, that's not how it works. You can't control them. You can change where you focus, and you can focus on more and more good things, but your thoughts are, are like a faucet. You know how on a faucet you got two taps? You got a cold and a hot, right? So imagine that your thinking is the cold tap represents you know, negative thoughts, and the hot tap represents positive thoughts. You can turn down the cold, but you can't ever turn it off. And you can turn up the hot all the way. And as a result, you'll get thoughts that are, moreover, happy and glad and good. But, but it's still going to have to deal with both. You, you, but through discipline, through focus, through learning to find and identify the good things, you, you'll be able to change overall. Now, here's a fifth one, a bonus one that's not in that book. I mentioned the happiness trap. But it's, I think, the most important one for Christian people to understand. There's a myth that happiness and holiness are synonyms. They're not. Just because you get holier doesn't mean you're going to necessarily get happier. Now, if you're like me, you go, well, 
wait a minute, there's very little in the Bible about how to be happy, but there's lots in the Bible about how to be holy, so it seems like God cares more about you being holy than he cares about you being happy. Well, I think that's a good objection. Especially when you consider that happiness is, is never really an end goal in itself. It's something we find while pursuing other more meaningful goals. But the reason I bring this up is because so many Christian people have a skewed and goofy understanding of holiness. We mistakenly think that holiness means sinning less or doing more good things. And so we get this framework where all we try and do is, okay, I can't screw up today. I can't say the S word or, or the D word or, or the F word or the, or the Q word. I'm just making up words right now. But, you know, you, oh, I, I just got to constrain my behavior to do as little bad things as possible. Well, that's not going to make you more happy. That's going to make you miserable. You might actually succeed in sinning less, but you'll be a quivering bag of anxiety <laughs> while you try, which I don't think is what God wants for you. Likewise, if you turn around and then only try and do more good things, I'm going to pray for four hours every day. I'm going to fast 24-7 for the rest of my life. I mean, you, you, you're only going to exhaust yourself trying to earn God's favor, which he's already given you, and you can't earn anyway. No, no, no. The only way that happiness and holiness coincide is if we understand happiness as what God wants for us. So Jesus, in John chapter 10, he says, I have come that you might have life and life more abundant. Abundant life is the thing Jesus wants for you. Abundant life is the thing he's trying to pass on to you and I. Now that doesn't mean you're not going to ever have difficulty. You will have difficulty, guaranteed, all the time. But you can be happy in the midst of your difficulties, in the midst of your struggles because of the great gift of God's presence and his spirit. Now, if you want to figure out how abundant life is defined, I, I think the easiest way is to use um, the fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5 as a kind of rubric. Okay, Like, how do I know if I'm experiencing abundant life? Well, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, kindness, self-control. I think that's all of them. There might be one or two more. I don't know. You don't know either, apparently, judged by the look on your face, so whatever. But, but, but I think when you go and look at those things, you realize, hang on, that's a totally different scorecard than how many times did I swear this week? How many mean thoughts did I think this week? No, no, no. Put, put your emphasis on love. Emphasize joy, kindness, Patience. I mean, look at the things that God says he values, that God says will be born in you the more you allow his spirit to work through you. Focus on that. And, and then, I think, happiness and holiness will overlap. Now, okay, there's a lot of information that's happened today. This is really just the thing that we're doing to kind of get you off on the right foot, to help you understand that happiness is about what you do, that happiness is about who you are becoming and the habits and practices you can cultivate where you live. And we'll get into all that in way more depth over the next couple months. But for now, I want to leave you with one thought. Really, I want you to leave yourself with one thought. Take your menu and write down one ambition that you've got for the next three months. Now, it could be an area of your life where you hope to have increased happiness. Like you hope that your marriage will be happy you hope that you'll be able to enjoy all the struggles and challenges of being a, a young mom while your kids are still in diapers and they're, you know, but maybe it's that you hope that God will help you actually enjoy exercise instead of feeling like you're being punished for it. Whatever. But write, write down one ambition that you have, uh, an, an area where you want to grow. Or maybe you're asking God to remove a roadblock, some major impediment to happiness in your life. Like maybe you've got a really jerky boss. Or maybe you've got a job that doesn't quite give you enough money to make ends meet, no matter how good a money manager you really are. Whatever. So an area where you want to grow, or maybe a roadblock, or, and this is the last one, is, is fun. Maybe a prayer that you've been too scared to pray. Maybe you've been afraid to ask God for somebody you could fall in love with. Maybe that's just too vulnerable or too raw. Well, Swing for the fences, man. Why not? M maybe you've been too afraid to ask God for the freedom or the permission to move somewhere you love. Whatever. I don't know what your thing is. But, but take this moment 
and prayerfully consider what you want to be different in your life with God's help over the next couple of months. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks so much for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Thanks that you, you do actually want us to be happy. You don't want us to be miserable. You don't want us to sit around and languish. You want us to experience the joy of your Holy Spirit. And so we pray, Lord, that you'd be our teacher, that we'd pay attention to what you're saying and what you're communicating, and in all things we'd give you thanks and praise. We pray these things, Lord, in your name. Amen.